their Chief Executive Officer, Paul Moritz. Good morning. It's a great pleasure to be with you here this morning. Now, you probably noticed that uh, the whole industry has caught cloud fever. <laughs> And uh, you might have noticed uh, that EMC and VMware are not immune to this particular malady. <laughs> uh, and it seems today that uh, everyone in the industry has to put the word cloud at the beginning, in the middle of, at the end of every sentence, <laughs> uh, to the point where one might even answer, ask, what does this word mean anymore? And uh, despite the hype, uh, I actually think that there are some fairly profound things uh, that are working behind this word that now gets applied to everything. And I'm going to try and take my time this morning to walk you through our particular view of why we think cloud really does matter. And with that as background, I think there are two big forces that are operating behind the same word, cloud. The first is an IT journey, transformation that's occurring inside your data centers. And the goal of that journey is a fundamental reduction in complexity inside the data, leading to a new architecture, a new business model for IT. At the same time, playing out, we see an end user and consumer journey. And that journey is really about a journey from a device-centric world to an information-connected, mobile-centric world. All of us are characterized increasingly by bodies of digital information that characterize us as individuals, our emails, our photos, our records, etc. All of these items of digital information are going to live with us for the rest of our lives. That information can't live inside any particular device. Uh, that information is going to have to come out of those devices and go somewhere into a digital repository in the cloud. And that's part of the transformation that is occurring before our eyes as consumers go on this cloud journey. Now, the interesting thing is there are technical interconnections between those two journeys. Uh, yesterday, you heard a lot from uh, the EMC folks about big data. A lot of the big data journey is actually being driven out of the consumer world. It is the consumer world that is generating the need to have these very large data repositories and new access methods. So when one looks at the new technologies that are coming, uh, like Hadoop, like the new loosely consistent data storage models, those all came out of the consumer side of this journey. And they're going to come back and affect what's happening on the IT side of this journey. So we're seeing these parallel interconnected journeys unfolding ahead of us. And of course, the question for us in the IT world is, you know, how do we make business sense of all of this? How do we apply these techniques that are emerging to really result in better business outcomes? And how do we do that in a way that we keep our names out of the paper, that we maintain a secure, reliable, compliant world. So most of my time this morning is going to be spent on the first of these journeys, the IT journeys. And picking up uh, from what uh, Joe and Pat were talking to you about yesterday, you might ask yourself, why does IT have to go on a journey? And the answer is in these statistics that Boards of directors and CEOs and CFOs are wising up to the fact that too much of today's IT spend is going on things that no longer generate fundamental business advantage. There are things that you need to have in your environment, just like you need to have buildings, but they're not making you necessarily a better competitor than the competitor down the street. And depending whose numbers you want to believe, 70% of the spend is going into things that are no longer differentiating. And the reason for that is over the last 20 years, we've allowed things to become too complex, too brittle. Uh, it's hard to measure. And 
we need to start focusing on freeing up the funds to go after not just the infrastru infrastructure backlog, but the application backlog. More and more companies are realizing that if you're stuck on application code that was written for an era of paper bills, you're not going to be able to participate in that consumer side of the cloud journey to be able to serve the Facebook generation in the way that they expect to see and consume information. So we need to go on a dual journey here, an infrastructure transformation journey followed by an application transformation journey. And of course, how do we do this in an evolutionary way? But before I get into the specifics of the journey, I want to focus on this middle uh, point, the point about measurement of IT. I started my working career uh, in the early 1980s in California working for Intel with Pat. Uh, we were both uh, junior payons inside the empire of Andy Grove. And uh, Andy was famous for having many pithy maxims. And uh, one of those was, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And one of the challenges with IT today, particularly at the infrastructure level, it's very difficult to manage. Basically, at the CEO level, the CFO level, the only metric you really have is what percentage of our revenue are we spending on IT. And when that's the granularity at which you can measure things, it's not a very satisfying world. One of the profound things that's happening because of that, those two intersecting journeys of an IT journey and a consumer journey is for the first time, we're seeing the emergence of a set of standardized metrics that you can start to apply to IT infrastructure. You can now go to your CIO and ask him questions like, Mr. CIO, how much does it cost us internally to provision a virtual machine per unit time, per unit memory? It's a course measure, but it's a very objective measure. It's one that you can apply equally across environments. You can ask questions like, how much does it cost us to store a gigabyte of data? You can ask questions about how long it takes us to stand up a new service how much it costs us to provision higher level capabilities like an email box or a CRM account. And not only can you ask these questions, but for the first time you can take the answers that you get and actually compare them to an external rate card that's being established in the industry. So you can take the answer that your CIO gives you and go look at that and see what will Rackspace or Amazon or anyone else offer that service for. Now there's a lot of your mileage may vary and things aren't exactly equal, but for the first time we're starting to get a basis for comparison. Now of course, when I realized this, the first thing that I did is immediately turn around to our CIO, Mark Egan, who, who must have the world's most thankless job for the amount of free advice that he gets, uh, and immediately asked him and said, you know, Mark, how much does it cost us inside VMware from our IT side internal IT side to provision a virtual machine. Not a particularly complicated company. Uh, it turns out that we have uh, 165 physical servers supporting about 10 times as many virtual machines that we use to run our uh, internal IT uh, shop. And uh, you know, I got an answer for him after lots of hemming and hawing and measuring and the rest of it. And it turns out it costs us inside VMware about six cents an hour to provision a virtual machine. Now we drive our infrastructure to pretty high levels of utilization. Our CPUs are operating at on average greater than 60% utilization, which is much higher uh, than we think most of our customers are driving their infrastructure. Uh, but it's interesting because you can now compare that six cents to a rate card out there in the industry that stretches at the lowest end from two cents to about 20 cents per virtual machine per hour, depending on the size of the virtual machine, et cetera. So for the first time, we're going to start being able to shine a light into infrastructure and start asking these questions. And what I think it's going to lead to, following Andy's maxim, is not only more informed and better and more efficient production of infrastructure, but equally importantly, more informed consumption of infrastructure. Because it's actually wrong to blame 
the ills of IT on the internal IT group. When the only measurement you have is a flat tax off the top of every business unit, there's no incentive on individual business units inside a business to be more informed and responsible consumers of IT. So we need to use these metrics to not only measure our production efficiencies, but start actually using them to engage in a more business-like conversation with the consumers of IT and say, this is what you're actually paying on a marginal basis for your services. Do you think these are worth paying for them or not? And if not, please don't ask for them. So this, I believe, is going to be one of the fundamental transformations that we go through from a both production and consumption point of view of IT. Now, setting on that, out on that journey is no small thing. And uh, we spend a lot of time with our customers trying to understand how customers move through this journey. Because it's always interested us uh, why there's such a great variation in the utilization of technologies like virtualization inside companies. If you look at the Gartner hype curve, virtualization is now way over to the right into the mature section. Uh, I think they put, Gartner puts virtualization on what they call the slope of enlightenment just before you enter, enter the plateau of productivity, <laughs> uh, which are the euphemisms that they use for a mature technology. <laughs> uh, so if virtualization is now considered a mere mature technology, why do we see such a great variation in the utilization of this technology inside accounts? We can go to similar accounts and in similar industries and find companies right today that are still less than 20% virtualized some that are going rapidly to 60% and a few leaders here at the 80 to 90% virtualization. So we spent a lot of time interviewing customers and came back with this social anthropological theory uh, of the adoption of technology into the infrastructure world of IT and uh, broke it up into three phases. And what we found out is, is New technology like virtualization typically comes in through the IT group itself. Some bright spark in IT figures out how to use this technology. They very rapidly apply it to all the things that they don't have to ask permission for. Uh, so they run through very quickly uh, all of IT's own infrastructure, all the apps that no one cares about, file, print servers, some web apps, et cetera. And that'll typically take an account of 20 to 30% virtualized. At that point, they run into this artifact of the governance of IT. That when IT is governed as a flat tax off the top of everybody, no individual business unit has any incentive to make their mission critical applications more efficient. They would much rather IT went and made some other business unit's applications more efficient. In other words, the attitude of it ain't broke, don't fix it, thank you. And uh, typically companies run into that barrier that they now have to start applying this technology to applications where there real, is a real customer who's critically dependent upon that application. To do this, typically actually what enables customers to make this transition is they have something bad happen. Typically one of these mission critical applications will go down. Uh, IT will say, we'll temporarily rebuild you on virtualized infrastructure just to keep you up and running. They rebuild them on virtualized infrastructure. They find out, in fact, that uh, they don't all catch the plague and, in fact, that they're able to do things very quickly. And the business unit says, why uh, did you were able to rebuild me in the space of an afternoon when you're telling me that for these other new services I want, it's going to take three months to do it? Uh, and that typically takes an organization well into this uh, phase of really going off to the mission-critical applications and customers, once they enter this, will very rapidly go through to about a 50 to 60 percent uh, virtualized uh, level. So we very find, seldom find companies in between that 20 to 30 percent and the 50 to 60 plus percent range. Once they get through that, then the IT group realizes this is not a tactical thing they're doing. This could actually be the foundation of a fundamentally new way of running IT and they start to think about, let's transform ourselves essentially into a much more business-driven internal service provider. And let's use all these technologies uh, to standardize, to become fundamentally more efficient, and to become 
above all, more metric driven in terms of both how we produce IT and how we uh, encourage business units to account for that IT. So these are the three phases that we have seen in our customers. Most of our customers today are in that second phase, exiting from the first phase, now tackling their mission critical applications, and a few leading customers have actually got all the way into the third phase. Uh, so a lot of what we are doing is laying out technology to enable the transition through the second phase and into the third phase. Now, to do that, there are a lot of challenges. We have to start with the fact that customers have a huge investment in existing applications. Uh, and ultimately, everything we in EMC sell today is merely a means towards an end. It's merely infrastructure that enables applications to run. So we have to start uh, with that body of applications. Start where they are, which is typically inside internal data centers allow customers to become more efficient in turn those internal data centers and start to be able to reach out in the future to purchasing infrastructure on a different business model, having the option if, and I underline if, it makes sense to rent the infrastructure rather than provision it themselves. And having done that, then start to think about renewing applications, which in the long run is the bigger challenge. And figure out not only do we renew applications, but how do we, in a secure and compliant manager, manner, absorb these SaaS applications that are coming in around the edges of IT and growing like weeds within the enterprise? And if all of that wasn't complicated enough, then how do we deal with the fact that just when we got good as an industry at provisioning Windows desktops and laptops, how do we deal with the fact that that world is fundamentally changing? Uh, not only are there new animals coming into the zoo there, lap, uh, tablets, smartphones, etc., they're not going to leave. But in many cases, these are employee-owned devices. IT can no longer assume that they can control the device that the user holds in his or her, her hands. The days when IT can say every person in this organization uses a black laptop with a particular version of Windows on it are rapidly passing. So tremendous challenge and complexity that we have to work our way through. The way that we think about this is three layers of a journey. First and foremost is infrastructure transformation because that's the only way uh, of allowing people to become more efficient, more agile, more metric driven in terms of their production and consumption uh, of existing applications. By definition, we have to do that underneath the applications at the infrastructure level. But we need to evolve that infrastructure and evolve the technology that will allow for application transformation, and then we have to allow for different ways to deliver both existing and future applications and SaaS applications in a secure and compliant way to the end user. Because IT is still going to be on the hook for all of this. Remember that the CEO has two asks out of, out of IT. <laughs> Number one, make us a more competitive business. Number two, keep my name out of the newspapers. <laughs> and uh, we in IT have to figure out how to deliver those two value propositions for our boards of directors and CEOs. <laughs> now, these three transformations are not just figurative transformations. We actually think something more profound is happening here. We are not subscribers to the bigger box theory of computing. That we are not subscribers to the belief that what we're seeing in IT today is a re-verticalization of IT, that the world's about, you know, is it going to be Oracle stack or IBM stack or Microsoft stack? We think cloud is more fundamentally about a new horizontal stratification. That what we're seeing is a new infrastructure that has to become more automated and more opaque. Applications can depend less on the infrastructure, have to depend less on the infrastructure in the cloud world, which means transformation in the application platform. And as I said, we need a transformation in how those app results of those applications, both existing and future, are securely delivered in a device-independent way to the end user. And as a result, 
we think these three layers are actually constitute a new horizontal cloud driven layering for IT. And this is the profound thing that's playing out in our industry rather than, you know, are you going to get a bigger box from vendor X or vendor Y? <laughs> so with that in mind, uh, we at VMware are laying out first and foremost for our customers an infrastructure transformation journey that obviously starts with virtualization. Now is that a self-serving thing? because we are the leaders in virtualization. Well, we're very happy to be the leaders in virtualization, but it has to start with virtualization because when you virtualize, what you're in essence doing is taking an existing application and putting it into a black box. You're encapsulating it and starting to cut some of the tentacles of, connect, of complexity that tie that application to the underlying infrastructure, and which, is, which in the, has resulted in all of that brittleness and complexity that I spoke about earlier. So, Virtualization is one of the few ways that you can take an existing application and start to isolate it from the web of complexity that surrounds it. When you virtualize, you encapsulate, which means that you put that application to a black box, you can jack the black box up, slide new functionality in underneath it, start sliding the black box itself around in the infrastructure, which then allows you to take those existing applications and mate them with the new techniques that are coming out of the cloud world in terms of how to drive high-scale automated infrastructure. So we agree with Gartner when they say virtualization is the catalyst that for most existing companies will unlock uh, the benefits of cloud computing. Now, how are we doing that at VMware? We're doing it by trying to build out a suite of infrastructure level products that address what we believe are the key needs for that infrastructure transformation journey. It starts obviously with our core product, uh, vSphere, which is the layer that provides the resource pooling and automated scheduling. When you work in a cloud-based way, what you're fundamentally trying to do is to pool together larger and larger sets of resources to create, figuratively speaking, a giant computer out of which many applications can eat. And as a result, you can get higher levels of efficiency because you have a bigger pool to schedule over. And you can get higher levels of resiliency because you can move things in around in the pool to compensate for bottlenecks or failures. So vSphere is our resource pooling and automation software. It happens to have a hypervisor inside it. It is increasingly the less interesting part of what vSphere is. We give away our hypervisor. Uh, if you want to go to our website, you can download ESXi. About 350,000 people a year, in fact, do so. Our value added is no longer the hypervisor. It is that scheduling and pooling that we do at that level. Now, to be able to use that in a secure way, we have to realize that it's not just applications that need to be scheduled over this pool. As Pat was explaining yesterday, most applications today are surrounded by a set of functions that assist or protect the application. When you deploy an application, you specify one or more firewalls that have to be associated with that, that application, that have rules in them designed to protect the application. You might have load balances that are associated with the application. You might have antivirus engines. You might have data loss engines like RSA provides associated with that application. And it is the application and the collection of those functions that assist and protect the application that in fact become the unit that has to be scheduled into that pool of infrastructure. And if we pick the application up and move it in real time from one edge of the infrastructure to the other to improve performance or deal with an outage, then the protective functions, the helping functions, the edge functions have to go along with that application. And that is what Pat was explaining yesterday, is why these edge functions have to go from being associated with physical boundaries to being associated with logical boundaries. Today, most of those edge functions are actually encapsulated in a physical device. You literally find the wire that's carrying the packets to the application, clamp the device onto the wire. With the problem then is if you move the application, you've got to go and unclamp the device physically and clamp it somewhere else. We need to virtualize all of those functions. So we have a layer that we call vShield. We're working with all of the key players in the industry who are turning their particular examples of functionality, their particular edge functions, 
into things that will plug into this framework. So we're working with all the usual suspects there. Checkpoint, Cisco, uh, Trend, uh, Symantec, et cetera, as well as, uh, as I'll mention later on, the RSA division that are transforming their data loss prevention appliance into a virtual appliance that will plug into this framework. Now, the next, having put that foundation in place, how do we make the user interface easier for consumers of IT to deal with? How do we create a layer that basically allows you not to worry about the details of the underlying pool of infrastructure that you've created and focus instead on the attributes or the loads that you want to put into that pool? That layer for us is something we call vCloud Director. It's the layer at which you associate policy with applications. It's the layer in which you can expose a service catalog to your users. It's the layer that we extract and report analytics about the usage of the infrastructure in terms that are meaningful to the consumers of those as applications. So it's at this layer that we create a construct that we call the virtual data center. A virtual data center is nothing other than a group of applications that share some common policy. A simplistic example might be I have all my production applications, I have all my test and development applications, uh, and if there's ever a contention down at the pool for resources, production wins over test. Or you could say I'm a service provider, I have a virtual data center for all of Coke's applications that I associate a policy with, I have a virtual data center for all of Pepsi's applications. And in fact, because those guys are so paranoid about each other, one of the policies we'll set is never put a Coke application on the same physical server as a Pepsi application. <laughs> or we'll keep those apart. So this is the point that we start introducing those policies into the world. It's the level at which we start exposing a end user oriented interface to the infrastructure, in other words, a service catalog. So this is where business units can come, pick a service, have that service associated with the appropriate policy provisioned into the pool, and it's the level at which we can start to extract appropriate analytics and start saying, this business unit consumed this set of lower level infrastructure. Correspondingly, they should either be figuratively or literally build at a certain rate. This is where we start to get the more intelligent consumption of IT coming into the picture. Now, the fourth key product that we're adding into our suite reflects how things have to change when infrastructure starts becoming more opaque. If you think about it, we're going to create this bigger pool of infrastructure that many applications are going to eat out of. Now, if you're the custodian of the pool, of the giant computer, you have a problem. You can't look at the behavior of any one application and know whether your pool is healthy or not. Even more problematic, if you turned on all of the logging capabilities of all of the elements down there in the pool, all the servers, the storage elements, the networking elements, the security elements, those elements would throw such a torrent of data of you, you'd never be able to make head or tail of it. <laughs> in fact, it's hard to even know how to categorize it, weight it, etc. So we have invested in a, what we believe is the direction that cloud-oriented infrastructure management has to go, which is to create essentially a custom real-time analytics application that operates on a statistical basis. It says, first of all, don't even try and make sense of all that data down there. Don't even try and figure out what's important or not. Just throw it all to us. Just give it to us, everything you've got. And we will apply statistical learning models to that to figure out, actually, what's important and what's not. We will build a profile of your infrastructure and tell you, according to that statistical profile, whether your infrastructure is healthy or not. Now, it's a statistical profile, which means that you will get occasionally false positives. Occasionally, this system will put up its head and say, we think you've just gone outside of the bounds of normal. And you can say, don't worry about that. That's just the end of the month. And it will learn, and it won't bother you about that particular pattern again. But what we found is this approach tends to be much more sensitive than humans 
to the drift out of normal of infrastructure. It will tend to give you much earlier warning that you've got the beginnings of a problem in your infrastructure. Uh, it will detect that, raise its head and say, you're beginning to drift outside of the bounds of normal. Here are the five factors that have driven it outside of the bounds of normal. We think you ought to go look at it. As I said, one time out of 50, it might be a false alarm, but we find that on average, those are actually very important things to pay attention to. This is part of what I said is how things have to change when you move to this new horizontal stratification. Typically, our industry has been about trying to manage from a vertical stack point of view, try and take the application and manage everything down to the hardware underneath it. In a cloud-based world, we're starting to get boundaries that cut horizontally across the world, and we have to look at things horizontally, which will have a huge impact, amongst other things, on how management is done. Now, this is just an interesting uh, uh, point that I wanted to show you in terms of how our value is changing. As I said, we're moving from a hypervisor company to a data center automation company. We track amongst our largest accounts uh, uh, the usage of the more advanced features that we offer. And uh, as you can see, as you go down the list here, customers are increasingly turning on these automation features. So we see customers starting to use DRS, which is our distributed resource scheduling. This is where we'll actually automatically move loads around in the cluster to optimize not only CPU and memory usage, but now I.O. performance as well. We see people taking the most extreme form of what we can do, which is full software fault tolerance, uh, where we will actually run an application in a tandem-like manner using commodity infrastructure. So if something fails, there's instantaneous failover onto uh, a capacity that we've reserved in the pool. Now, that's an example of how we need to feed those business analytics back, because when somebody puts the check marks next to an application, and that's all you have to do these days to make an application fault tolerant, we have to then go look in the pool and reserve enough capacity down in that pool that we can get that instantaneous failover, which means that application is eating twice its quota of resources all the time. That needs to be reflected back to the end user and say, do you really want us to run this fully fault tolerant matter? It's going to cost you more. You decide. <laughs> now, I mentioned that we want to go on a transformation journey uh, to allow customers to become fundamentally more efficient and more metric driven inside their own internal infrastructure. This is we use the label, the private cloud, for all of those techniques. Most of our customers are, are intending to go this direction. Uh, but we need to not only do that, but we need to say, if you do all the things that to implement a private cloud, you will also be doing the things that will allow you to, with less difficulty rather than more difficulty, access external infrastructure in the future. So we need to open it up so that people can take applications and on a business-driven decision, decide to move those applications from their internal infrastructure to the external infrastructure. And to do this, we have to get that user interface, figuratively speaking, to be the same. Because if the way that you're going to manage and secure applications, the way that you're going to associate policy in the external cloud is fundamentally different from the way that you do it in the internal cloud, it's no longer a business decision. And equally importantly, once you've got it into the cloud, you need to have the option to get it back out again. <laughs> that if you don't like that service provider or they experience an outage, you have an option to push it somewhere else. So for this reason, uh, we've been working with a set of partners within the much broader set of service provider partners uh, that we work with today. And, and, and we have literally thousands of service provider partners who are renting vSphere uh, for operation inside their clouds. But we've picked a small subset of those service providers who are committed to not only implement the full stack, to give you the same user interface that you will experience internally to that you experience externally, but they're also committed to the full gamut of best practices of what it means to be a service provider 
all the physical audits, etc. And there are companies who are willing to have a discussion with you about such things as liability. And not only are they willing to have that discussion, but most of them are big enough that if you ever had to cash that check, you probably could get paid out on it. There's a lot of discussion, for instance, about what happens when you go into the cloud. A lot of the providers today are very honest about the liability protection that they give you. Amazon is very upfront. They assume no liability. That's not sufficient. That's not an acceptable answer if we're going to take serious applications and put them into the cloud. So we need partners who are not only technically capable, but are also ca from a, uh, in terms of putting the full stack in place, but are also capable of talking in terms that enterprises will expect. And it's for that reason that we're working with a group of providers that we call our vCloud data center providers, uh, who range from some of the largest companies in the world, uh, Verizon, Singtel, Computer Sciences Corporation, Colt over in Europe. And we've put a couple of nimble guys in there just to keep the big boys uh, honest as we go forward. These companies are committed by the end of this year uh, to have 25 data centers around the world in operation that will offer that common user interface that I was speaking about. So that you can have the option of partnering with one or more of these customers and being able to reach out into the set of resources on a global basis. Uh, so if you have regulatory restrictions uh, that require you to host certain applications and certain data in certain jurisdictions like Germany or Japan, there'll be a partner there who can work with you. <laughs> now, as I said, infrastructure is the first order of business because that's what allows us to address e existing applications. But we believe over the coming decade, a story that will be as big or even bigger will be the transformation of applications. And we have started to look and say, how can we shoot ahead of the puck? How can we try and identify those key technologies that will really define not today's generation of applications, but tomorrow's generation of applications? And there are certain key changes that we're trying to key off there. The first one is, is in the last five plus years, we've seen a developer-led revolt against complexity. Developers have kind of looked at that world that we saw earlier and said, we're not going to wait for the IT guys to do something about this. We're not going to wait for the industry to do something, but we're going to do something about it ourselves. And as a result, developers, just when we thought that the world had crystallized around EJB and .NET, developers said enough of this. Uh, we're going to take the matters into our own hands. And you've seen the emergence of these new programming frameworks like Spring, like Ruby on Rails, like Node.js, like Django, et cetera, that are all bottoms-up, developer-led initiatives, fundamentally about saying these things are just too complex. We need a better way of doing them. And if you're an old guy like me who started my career as an assembly language programmer, I can assure you, you'd look at some of these new technologies and your head would be filled with horror. Uh, if you've ever looked at the Ruby programming language, it seems like they almost deliberately try to do everything they could to be as impossible to apply a compiler and an optimizer to it. <laughs> uh, but then suddenly you take a step backwards and you say, it kind of makes sense. They believe through the good works of Pat and his colleagues in, their, in Intel that we have this amazingly powerful hardware to work with now. Let the hardware sweat. Why should we developers sweat? We'll let the hardware do the work. So let's come up with a set of constructs that are optimized for the first time for us, not the hardware. And that's the real theme behind all of these new programming frameworks. And on top of that, they're saying we want to stay up at the level of abstraction that we want to deal with. We don't want to deal with the details of the underlying middleware. And we need new data paradigms. A lot of these applications coming out of that consumer journey can no longer be done with a traditional centralized relational database model for two reasons. One is scale, the other is flexibility. They're saying we're in the situation where we have to touch the end user directly. 
That means that we have to plan for where we're not just dealing with internal users, but we want to project beyond the borders of our com company out into the broader world. We have to think about architectures that will potentially touch hundreds of thousands of millions of users. You can't do that with a traditional centralized relational database model. The second thing is we don't know how our users are going to react to all of those applications. We're not smart enough to think in advance what is the exact schema of the data that will underlie this application for all time. We know that there are going to have to be new features introduced to this application. We need something where we can morph the schema without losing efficiency as we go forward, which is leading to the second big ferment in the application development world, which is the advent of these new database structures. Not only the NoSQL movement, but basically the Hadoop movement, the scale out movement, et cetera. When you put all of these things together, we think this represents, once again, a once in every 20 or 30 years turnover in application paradigms and infrastructure. And it's for that reason that we've gone out and tried to invest ahead of the curve trying to pick best of breed examples of the technologies that we think will be needed here. This started two years ago with our acquisition of the Spring Programming Framework, which is the leading modern framework in the Java development world. More than half of new lines of Java code are being written in the context of the Spring Framework again, not because IT told them to, but because IT said, we're much happier working in this environment. We can be much more productive there uh, than the traditional environments. Now, two weeks ago, or uh, uh, well, three weeks ago now, uh, on April 12th, we really took a very big step forward in this space. And this is work that we've been working on internally for two years. And the very loose analogy, and you have to be careful about this analogy, is if you think about that blue layer, the infrastructure layer that I was talking about a few minutes ago, which has to become more automated and more opaque, that is in some sense becoming the new hardware of the cloud era. That's the thing that you're going to just increasingly depend upon to work. If you're an application developer, you don't want to know any of the details of what's going on down there. You just expect it to work. Uh, in the same way as these days, we expect a modern Intel microprocessor to just work. Tremendous complexity inside a modern Halem processor, speculative execution, threads of execution, multiple levels of caching. Uh, the internals of that operating system, of that microprocessor, are probably the same complexity as an operating system was 10 or 15 years ago. You're not allowed to know about any of it. All you're allowed to depend upon is it'll work. It'll give you that instruction set. Infrastructure has to become the same way. So if infrastructure is becoming the new hardware, the question you might ask, and, and be you have to be careful how far you push this, is what's going to be the new operating system? Are we going to end up with lower level infrastructures that have proprietary APIs on them for application development? Are we going to go back, in essence, to the mainframe world as it was in the 60s and 70s? Well, will the industry say, Nope, we're going to have a cloaking layer that will isolate us from all of those details. In the same way as the industry seized upon Unix, turned it into Linux, and said, this is going to be our cloaking layer that isolates us from any particular underlying hardware architectures. And our belief was that the industry would do that. The industry would revolt against clouds becoming the ultimate California motels that you can check your application into but never check it out of. <laughs> and inevitably, the open and open source movement would come up with an open cloaking layer that would be capable of being deployed across multiple infrastructure level clouds. So rather than sitting on our heels and waiting for that to happen, uh, we decided to go ahead and be the first mover there and fill this vacuum. So two years ago, we hired some very senior folks out of Google. They had run everything uh, that has an API on it in Google, all the, the internal infrastructure. We put them to work and said, if you were to redo this uh, from what you had learned in operating at very, very high scales inside Google, how would you do it? How would you correctly factor and lay it? 
and they've come up with a layer that we call Cloud Foundry, which we have released as an open and open source project under an Apache 2 license. Uh, and it's our goal for this to go everywhere. We want to see this on top of vSphere and VMware-based infrastructure clouds. We want to see it on top of Amazon. We want to see it on top of Rackspace. We're even, as you'll see in a moment, going to put it on an individual virtual machine so that every developer can have his own instance on his laptop. This layer has basically three sets of interfaces. One is, is it's uh, open to these new and old programming frameworks. So you can plug these frameworks together. The three that we announced out of the box were the Spring, the Ruby family, and the Node uh, framework. People have already started in adding work on adding PHP and Erlang uh, to this in the two weeks that it's been available. It has a second set of interfaces that allow you to plug both existing and new services into, both existing relational database models, new database models, new queuing services, et cetera. So you only have to plug them in once and make them available to all of these different programming frameworks. And then it has a binding layer that will bind all of that uh, to a particular infrastructure level cloud. And there's very sophisticated scheduling and scaling operations that happen in the middle of that. It knows how to take policy and basically take care of all the housekeeping of how to get an application to scale. It is, in fact, a very sophisticated cluster controller designed to be never taken down. Now, this is what came from those guys who came from Google, is they realized that the big challenge here, the changes when you run 7 by 24, 365, is you have to be able to upgrade in place. You can't say, Sunday night for two hours, we're taking the infrastructure down for maintenance. <laughs> so actually, some quite sophisticated thinking inside this. We will obviously take that layer and bind it to vSphere and our vFabric middleware layers, the particular services that we have. And as a way to allow developers to experience this, we've actually stood up an instance of this ourselves out of our Las Vegas data center. Uh, and that's available as a test service for developers right now, uh, where you can go there as a developer, sign up for an account, start deploying applications. And uh, we've been actually very gratified by the response. We've, in the two plus weeks we've been uh, operating, we've had over 20,000 developers sign up. We have about 2,000 applications running in that cloud now. Now, granted, most of those are kind of kick the tires, hello world kind of applications. Uh, but it's actually very interesting to see the interest here, and it sort of confirms our belief that this was a vacuum that needed to be filled. I wanted to lastly very quickly talk about uh, end user access. Uh, the key challenge here is we're moving into the post PC era. It's not that laptops and Windows are going to go away, it's just that they're going to have to share the stage with other devices. Uh, IT can no longer assume that all they have to do is to manage Windows desktops. Not only that, but uh, we're moving into a world where the world is becoming less document-centric. If you think back what uh, happened at Xerox PARC in the 1970s and then what myself and many others worked on at Microsoft and Apple and others in the 1890s, we were trying to automate a 19 70s era physical desk. We looked at the desk with its pile of paper and its drawers and its typewriter on it and we said, our goal as an industry is to automate that desk. Uh, it was a world where we, most desk workers spent their time preparing documents. And everything we did is reflected that. You can even see it in the terminology, desktop, files, folders, inbox, outbox, uh, word processor, etc. That world is passing as well. It's not that documents are going to go away. It's that individuals no longer live in a world where creating documents is their central activity. More and more of us are, in fact, digesting streams of information that come at us in much smaller chunks. Uh, we filter those streams, we recombine them, and we stream information back out again. So fundamental change happening here, which is not just a form factor change, it's a change in how we work. And when you put all of these things together, we think that that means quite a big change for our industry. And we need to go from a world where IT 
essentially manages devices to a world where IT equips and capabilities and installs them, if you like, to people rather than devices. IT needs to create a, have a way of creating a set of capabilities associated with a person and have those capabilities manifest on whatever device uh, they happen to touch at that point during the day. Now this has to be an evolution as well, so this builds off our view desktop virtualization software, which is still essentially a Windows-centric view of the world. It allows you to take that Windows laptop and run it in the data center rather than on a physical device. But we will be complementing that with a set of technologies that now start to speak to this fundamentally post-PC era, a world where we're not just dealing with laptop form factors, but we're dealing with a new set of applications. We will be introducing uh, next week our first step in this direction, something we call Horizon, which is the beginnings of creating that capability to allow IT to install applications to a user rather than a device. This will be initially focused at the SaaS-based world, but it will expand beyond there to address both legacy Windows applications and other applications as well. We also have some interesting experiments, uh, one that we call MVP, which is to address essentially how do you provide a secure environment on a smartphone. And uh, the idea is there is that IT, instead of purchasing physical phones for their users, can essentially equip them with a virtual phone, ask the user to go buy their own physical phone, and that virtual phone will be installed on the physical phone, and the user will have what amounts to two phones on one phone, two phone numbers, two environments, etc. Uh, the advantage of that is if the user happens to, in his her, her private life, install a copy, you know, a hacked copy of Angry Birds, uh, that copy of Angry Birds won't be reading the corporate address book and transmitting it to Turkmenistan. Uh, instead, we can wall those two worlds off. Now, will users like that kind of schizophrenic existence? We're not sure but we're gonna go find out and see what they tell us. Now, that completes sort of the journey from a macro point of view. There are many parts along this journey as you would have picked up from uh, Joe's and Pat's presentations just yesterday where VMware and EMC intersect and complement each other. And we're working together at each of these layers uh, to bring our products together into something that we hope is greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, we're working together clearly in storage. Uh, we're working together even more importantly in storage management. Because if we're gonna go to a world where you just associate policies with applications and the underlying infrastructure takes those policies and does the right things, we have to get close coordination between what we're doing in the data center autom automation virtualization world and what the arrays are doing underneath it. So we need to enrich the dialogue between the two layers, and we're working together uh, in that direction. All right, we're working together with integrated uh, and converged infrastructure, both with, uh, in the context uh, directly with EMC, but in particular with the context of the VCE alliance. All right, we're working together with security. As I mentioned, RSA uh, is, amongst other things, uh, transforming their physical data loss appliance into a virtual appliance that can be plugged into that framework and allow it to be associated with logical boundaries rather than physical boundaries. Uh, we're working together to make sure we have the right characteristics in the underlying infrastructure layer to support these new application types that will be dealing with big data and analytics. We're working together uh, with the information management and governance group, and I'll hit, uh, come back to this in just a second, uh, and lastly, in terms of delivering a new device experience, we're working with EMC to make sure that we have tuned experiences for the virtual desktop from both a performance and a cost point of view. Now, I'm very happy to give a great example of this today, which is the work that we've been doing together with the Information Intelligence Group uh, at EMC around a project that was announced this morning uh, called EMC On Demand, and it brings together basically almost all of these, the threads in these three layers. What it is, is a new way of consuming enterprise scale information management applications. 
We know that one of the things that's annoying to customers is just how long it takes to get a solution stood up. Assembling all the pieces, putting them together, tuning them is just a lot of work. Customers want to just take a solution and have it work. So what we've done with the EMC Information Intelligence Group is to take their best of breed information governance and management assets and turn them into essentially a set of managed solutions. These are solutions that underneath the hood take many of the particular elements that come out of the VMware stack, combine those with elements that have been built up in the EMC information governance stack and put them together in a way where customers don't have to do that integration themselves. These get fused together into a new construct uh, that is called the V-Cube, which is basically what you can think of as all the resources needed to provide the logical functions for a particular customer. So each customer can think of themselves now as having a V-Cube that has on tap, on demand, all of my information management services. Uh, these V-Cubes are managed by a V-Cube manager, which means that there can be many of these cubes, either one per customer or one per department or one per business line. And these V-Cubes can be deployed initially out of a cloud. So you can start and say, to begin with, I want to have it stood up for me in an external data center managed by EMC's professionals. When I get comfortable with it and the business case is justified, I then have the option of leaving it there in the cloud. Or if I'm concerned about security, I can actually bring it on-premise and have it be a managed on-premise service for me in my own data center. So great example of where we think things are going in terms of combining technology and business models as we go forward. And EMC is taking its full suite of information management and governance applications and putting them into this new delivery framework. And I invite you to read the material on this, start kicking the tires. We think this is a great example of where things are going in the future. So with that, I want to close then on our journey, which is to to take customers to allow them to transform their applications, become fundamentally more metric driven, have new options in terms of how you want to purchase infrastructure, and on top of that information transformation journey, then go after the bigger challenges of application transformation and how we deliver the results to the end user. So thank you very much, I appreciate it. <laughs>